Hello everyone, greetings from the 7th of Nero, AJ here, with another introduction to the playable factions of War Machine and Hordes. The title should say it all as usual, but for newcomers it'll be the Protectorate of Menoth and Grimkin. Believe me, the temptation to do a mythological deep dive into the lore was strong in this one, given how these two factions are inexorably linked to each other via their divine origins, while the actual individuals that compose the counterpart factions aren't really that associated with each other, except through religious or heretical lore. On the one hand, there are unrelenting proclamations of heresy and the need to cleanse, while on the other, there's the disavowal of Menoth as a god undeserving of his faithful. Unsurprisingly, they don't get on with each other particularly well. That said, it's always a fun exercise thinking of reasons why they're on the same side in unbound scale multiplayer, multi-faction, multi-caster, multi-whatever else games. Nonetheless, herein is the intro to the successors to Salon and the source of Menoth's longest headache. The Protectorate of Menoth finds its origins in the rise of the Morrowin religion in what would become Signar. During the Orgoth occupation, followers of Morrow became the majority in the southwest of the Amoran mainland, though Menites remained a significant proportion of the population. Centuries after the defeat of the Orgoth, unrest among Menites stirred with a flagrant disregard for the Accord by Hand covenant shown by Malagant. The senior Menite priests held the right to oversee the succession to the Signaran throne, but Malagant ignored this right and replaced the Menites with more accepting Morrowin advisers. And when the Church of Menoth refused to recognize the usurper's claim to the throne, he betrayed his corrupt nature by imprisoning or executing many of their number. What harmony there was between Menite and Morrowin was shattered, and here, in Caspia, it remains broken still. The Church would continue in earnest efforts to return Signar to the guiding hand of the lawgiver, but their efforts were rebuffed. This would go on until the rise of Visgoth Sulon. Around him, Menites had descended into squalor over the past two centuries, with their only hope found in the great temple of the Creator. There, Salon gathered the faithful who flocked to his sermons by the thousands and declared that Menites would make a new nation for themselves. War followed when the Signarans resorted to forceful means to halt this holy gathering. It ended with Salon's death, but under the auspices of his loyal second-in-command and eventual successor, Ozeal I, the lands east of the Black River were granted to the Menites. Arid and barren, it was a strip of dirt stained by the Signarans, but seen as a test of faith and piety to the followers of Salon. Thus was created the land that was the Protectorate of Menoth. But the Protectorate is far more than the land that borders describe on a map. Indeed, it is nothing without the faithful, who follow Salon's example in devout worship of the Creator of Man, no matter where they may be. Nonetheless, the Protectorate proper, prior to the gains made by the Northern Crusade, is divided into four provinces. From north to south, they are Sulon March, with its capital Sul, where the Protectorate was born, Gedora, with the nation's capital Emir, Vardan, and Ichthosa to the far south, where there is the cradle of humanity, ancient Ichthia. As a nation that cares not for the ethnic origins of its people, government is centred around the Church of Menoth as decreed by Sulon. In the Iron Kingdom's era, extending to the current day, the Hierarch is the supreme ruler of both church and state. Under the Hierarch are the Visgoths, who currently number nine, but may vary in quantity depending on the needs of the nation. The Synod of Visgoths is responsible for the oversight of the daily life of the Protectorate's people, and whose support is required for the Hierarch to assume his position. In the middle of the hierarchy are the sovereigns, who are responsible for the faithful within a particular region, and the most senior priests that the majority of worshippers will be able to gain an audience with. Potentates serve sovereigns in maintaining the rights and order within their sphere of influence, while priests are responsible for seeing to the people's spiritual needs from day to day. Most junior are the fledges, who attend priests, and, if fortunate, potentates, as they carry out their training in readiness to fully join the priesthood. A little separate from this echelon are the scrutators, who answer to the hierarch directly, though many Visgoths also serve as high-ranking scrutators. These high-ranking priests serve as the arbiters of Menoth's judgment against the unbelievers. However, those who require more forceful judgment to be converted back to the ways of the lawgiver must answer to the executioner interdiction, led by the high executioner and officered by the most zealous of scrutators. Parallel, but nonetheless closely tied to the church, is the military which is divided into crusades and garrisons, each of which combine various contributions from the protectorate's martial traditions and knightly orders. As defensive formations, the garrisons have fluid organisation that typically follow along the lines of the crusades organisation. 
as do the Crusades themselves, they are divided into strategically determined strike forces called interdictions, each of which generally draw their constituent units from one or a few closely related martial orders within the Protectorate. Within each interdiction are varying numbers of phalanxes, which equate to a conventional military platoon, with detachment as the smallest tactical unit, equivalent to squads. Ranks differ from order to order, but despite the difference in naming convention, material authority is rarely called into question. For example, the Knights Exemplar Order is led by the Grand Exemplar, aided by High Exemplars, who in turn command Seneschals. And while the numbers available to the Protectorate are comparable to those of their enemies, owing to their lack of resources, their equipment and its quality suffers. As a result, great value is placed in their martial orders, and each one is an elite formation that more than matches the professional armies that they face. Their warcasters are similarly an elite that they value, just as any other nation does their battlegroup commanders. But the Protectorate have a difficult relationship with magic of most varieties, including that which contributes to the construction of cortexes and their resultant warjacks. As zealous followers of Menoth, any magic that manifests within them must be a divine origin, specially ordained by Menoth to his agents on Cain, or purged. Those who display sufficient loyalty and diligence to the cause may be allowed to offer penance by service in battle or secluded worship to gain Menoth's favour for possessing such profane powers, knowing that they use their curses to further the will of the Protectorate and of Menoth. Thus, those who display the Warcaster gift are singled out at an early age and given over to the church and temple to be conditioned and purged of inappropriate thought. From the moment they cross the threshold to where they receive their education and training, also known as the Lyceum, they are also given over mind, body and soul to the service of the lawgiver, with a singleness of purpose that can never be questioned or shaken. Warcasters are brought up to believe that their gifts are granted by Menoth, just as the strength of their fellow warriors and the faith of their fellow priests are gifts from Menoth. Though this would be considered by the enemies of the Protectorate as a cynical lie told to youngsters by the knowing elders, the power of their belief and the force of their magic born from their faith is an undeniable truth to those who reject the canon of the true law. However, it is not always possible to divine out those who would be warcasters until it is too late, as the gift may make itself known only in adulthood. In such cases, most of the martial orders of the Protectorate have the means to acclimatise these new warcasters to their gifts, and liaise with the priests of the Lyceum to ensure the power is controlled, nurtured and given due reverence before Menoth. Nevertheless, these examples of warcasters who are not explicitly part of the priesthood remain with their order, so that their previous service may be built upon with their newfound gifts. It should come as no surprise, though, that owing to the great power inherent within a warcaster, no few orders are led, whether in fact or in effect, by warcasters. All of them, however, accede to the will of the Hierarch and the Synod of Visgoths. There is one exception to this, though, and that is the Harbinger, who holds a special position of spiritual authority, as the voice of Menoth on Cain, personal advisor of the divine to the Hierarch, and beacon of glory and hope to the devoted. Every aspect of her being is a result of divine miracle, and none other can claim otherwise of her, or likewise of themselves. Unfortunately for these faithful servants, no matter who they are, their tools of war and the means to make and maintain them are an unclean and profane technology. The Protectorate's leadership is pragmatic and sensible, though, and despite the heresy inherent within Mechanica and other arcane gifts and darts, they knew that without warjacks and the ability to construct and repair them, they would be unable to bring the true law back to the all mankind as was their purpose. By rites, prayer and inscription, warjacks are blessed, purified and sanctioned for use in battle. Like their Kaedoran rivals far to the north, the Protectorate of Menoth was always going to struggle to compete with Signaran technology and strength. Owing to the reluctance with which the pious adopted Laborjacks and the Cortex, many of the first Warjacks were cobbled together from smuggled parts and ill-gotten acquisitions from the black market. Over time, though, the Protectorate came to have its own fledgling Warjack manufacturing capabilities, incorporating unique technology and weaponry, such as the volatile oil known fittingly as Menoth's Fire, which is used in such machines as the Repenter and Vanquisher. The divine decree that demands the use of seemingly impure means reached its culmination in the Avatar of Menoth, a warjack like no other. Designed by godly visions, crafted by the hands of men, and driven by the will of Menoth, it is the wrath, faith, and authority of the lawgiver granted form in metal and prayer. The Avatar serves as the shield to the pious and the sword that strikes the faithless down. And assigned to the Warjacks are the Battles of Menoth, whose foreign, but increasingly native arcanists, who submit themselves before the priesthood in the hope that their blasphemous magics may be put to use for a worthy cause.
They know that while their work will receive much acclaim, they themselves never will. A life of purgatory is ordained to them to gain the glory that Menoth will judge them where they are not to receive. Far beyond such vassals, beyond the faithless of the Iron Kingdoms, beyond those whose very existence is an act of desecration to the priests of the Protectorate, however, are the forces of those who are anathema to the Creator himself. When mankind was but a struggling race, Menoth's trusted priest, general and hero founded the city of Akrenia, which are but ruins today. Over time, though, as he served his god faithfully, he became disillusioned with what Menoth was meant to be for mankind, and what mankind was meant to be for Menoth. A point came when he realised that while he was indeed the creator of man, Menoth was not the lawgiver that mankind either desired or deserved, and he rebelled alongside those with whom he would be called the Defiers. Tales of the five Defiers' origins were told from the very time of their exile, evolving with each generation as the stories were passed from parent to child, unchecked by the creator's priests who did not realise the power of these fairy tales, or more importantly, the power of believing in them. While the Grimkin may look grotesque and repulsive before the eyes of mankind, they are but a mirror, displaying the true nature of Menoth's distortion of mankind, bending even the slightest of digressions from his supposed true lord into the most heretical of vices. This truth confirms the defiers that Menoth did not deserve to have worshippers among men, for he had made mankind weak, merely for the benefit of his own personal glorification. They had long known that the good were not rewarded, only the obedient, that the evil were not punished, only the defiant. Indeed, the inherent desire to better oneself by fair means or foul compelled the very worst in humanity to use Menoth's precepts to lead base lives, twisting his gifts and his words for selfish ends. Menoth did not judge these souls, so the defiers did, and in their judgments they came to see that the cycle was merely repeating itself and realised that change must come. The myths and legends told now shaped the defiers' vision of the Grimkin, and they learned that while they themselves were too great a pantheon to return to Cain unaided, tiny apertures left in the barrier between realms as souls departed from their dying vessels allowed their servants to slip back from Urcane to Cain. Thus were they sent forth by their masters to seduce and persuade, causing mischief and whispering their replies to the wishes of susceptible souls, awaiting the defiers' declaration of their return. There seems to be no organisation, no pattern, no logic behind how the Grimkin conduct themselves. But this is but one among many layers of deception and revenge laid by the defiers, for it is natural for them to reject the notion of order that the Creator forced upon his followers. This is keenly reflected among the nightmares, Ironically, foolishly, arrogantly, the nightmares were supposed to be Menoth's ultimate punishment on the defiers, manifestations of their dreams made real to rack their existences, waking and slumbering. It took untold time, but against Menoth's every expectation, the defiers eventually overpowered the nightmares that tormented them, looked at them defiantly, and robbed them of their power. The nightmares would be the first of their weapons against the world that grovelled before their nemesis, as to the form that they take, where the living seek to bury all their shame beneath the veneer of orderliness and cleanliness, the nightmares are the truth of a man's heart laid bare, aberrant and horrifying. For remember, the defiers were but mortals once, and like their fellow servants, the Grimkin are a reflection of the heart and soul, all its selfishness, its foolishness and its pettiness, piteously yearning for a purity that it does not need and cannot attain. Though the heretic was the greatest among the defiers in life, and exerted his will the greatest during their exile, he is a first among equals at most among the five. He realises his differences from the rest, all of them unique in their suffering and reason to seek vengeance. Even alongside Zivana Agar, the old witch, who opened the door for them to return to Cain, there is no real chain of command among the defiers, each going about their activities independently as they see fit, coming and going to best sow chaos among humanity. For the old witch knows that the defiers are merely a lesser enemy who can do a greater harm against the true enemy than against humanity. For the one who has better laid plans than any god, she knows it is only a matter of time before she must turn on the defiers and send them back to her cane where they belong. It may be a grim day for all humanity, blessedly ignorant as they are now, when the defiers have served their purpose on Cain and discover a betrayal as great to them as that of Menoth's.